Hi, Bridge family. Pastor Brandon here. Excited that you're watching together today as we open up Scripture together. I want to encourage you to grab your Bibles and turn to Matthew 4. We're going to be in verse 1 through 11. We're continuing to look at the things Jesus did and said in the season of home church. And today we're looking at Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have some sort of account of this temptation in the wilderness. And it's placed as like a hinge moment from Jesus' obscurity to his public ministry. This is a significant moment for Jesus, and it's, it's one that's going to shape his ministry. And before we dive in, I just want to ponder with you for a second. How did we get this story about Jesus? Get this story about his battle with the devil in the wilderness. Most every other story in the gospel accounts have Jesus with other people, other witnesses, right? So say a person he heals or a crowd that he fed or the disciples right next to him witnessing of what he did. But the story of Jesus in the wilderness is just Jesus alone. And that's a rare thing. And I think we can assume that Jesus told his disciples about this moment. I mean, can you imagine for a second Jesus sitting down with his disciples and telling him about his testing in the wilderness? Because I think he knew that his disciples would face their own wilderness and their own testing from the enemy. So start with me today in verse chapter 4, verse 1. We'll start with just the first word, then. The first word of the passage we read today is the word then, because just before this moment in the wilderness, something significant happened in the life of Jesus. Just go back a few verses to 3, verse 16 and 17. And when Jesus was baptized, he immediately went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my Son with whom I am well pleased. Before Jesus does anything in his ministry, the Father says, this is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. It's identity language. Jesus being anointed, the long-awaited, the anticipated Messiah of Israel. Let's keep reading. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Scripture says, he was hungry, right? You would be too. That's an intense turn from this baptism to this battle between Jesus and the devil. And before we keep going into what those temptations were, there's so many layers in the story that we can't even explore them all today. But just a couple of quick overview um, things just to help us grab what the significance of this moment is, especially in those first two verses that we read. In light of the whole story of scripture, some of the words packed in those first two verses should pop off the page because we've heard them so many times before. Right? Think about his baptism. We have Jesus coming out of the water. We have God speaking a voice from heaven. Sonship is bestowed from God. Wilderness, temptation, the number 40, this time days. What other story in scripture do you begin to recall? Yeah, the Exodus story. The story of Israel being redeemed, rescued out of Egypt, and then tested in the wilderness. In fact, let's look at a passage in Deuteronomy 8 that is Moses recalling the story to the people of Israel after they spent 40 years in the wilderness before they enter the promised land. It's Deuteronomy 8, verse 2. It says this, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live on bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Does that sound familiar? So here we have Jesus as a representative and fulfillment of Israel facing a similar testing. Now, did Israel pass or fail their test? They failed. One more layer. Where else in the story of Scripture do we have the Spirit descending, hovering over the waters, a voice of God, sonship bestowed, 
and a tempter approaching a son of God with questions about whether or not we can trust God. That's the very beginning of the story. Adam and Eve in the garden. Not only is Jesus here in the story representing all of Israel and their failed covenant with God, but all of humanity and our failed covenant with God. And did Adam and Eve pass or fail their test? Yeah, they failed. We have Jesus entering into the wilderness to be tested by the evil one as a representative. Will Jesus pass this temptation? Let's keep reading. Verse three, and the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God. Who's this tempter? He's called here the devil or or his title, the Satan, which means the accuser. And he comes to tempt Jesus and notice how he does it. He starts with a question, if you are the son of God. He questions the very word that God speaks to Jesus at his baptism. God saying, this is my son. The devil saying, if you are the son. And then Matthew goes on to give us three temptations that the accuser brings to Jesus. And that translated word, tempted, could also be translated tested, which I find just really helpful as I was studying this week because our English word tempted almost always has a negative connotation to it, right? No one is ever tempted to say something nice to their mom. But we know what a test is like, right? If you're a student watching today and you spend a significant amount of time learning something, how do you know that you've in fact learned it? You're tested on it. A test is a set of difficult circumstances that reveal the truth, the truth about who we are. So here you have Jesus in the wilderness, fasting, praying, preparing for ministry. And what do you think is on his mind? I think we could assume he's preparing for how to go about his work as the son of God, as the Messiah. And it's then that the enemy comes with thoughts that will test what kind of Messiah Jesus will be. Let's read now. Verse three. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. Satan presents Jesus with the first two temptations. Remember that Jesus at his baptism was revealed as the son of God, the Messiah. And so to understand what these temptations are, we need to ask a really important question. What were the Jewish people looking for in the Messiah? They were looking for someone to liberate them from their current situation. The oppressive Roman occupation, their sufferings that they were enduring, And this Messiah would do incredible things and bring back Israel to how it should have been, replacing the Roman government with Israel over the world as a superpower at that time. So the enemy says, turn these stones to bread. You're hungry, Jesus. Your people are hungry. Use the authority that the Father has given you for yourself, your own needs, and everybody else's immediate needs jump off a high building, right? God won't let your foot hit the ground, Jesus. Create a situation where you force God to do something spectacular, undeniable. And guess what? The people will see who you really are. The implication implication was clear from these first two tests. If you do this, Jesus, people will know for certain that the Messiah they're waiting for is you, and you can do that both quickly and spectacularly. Both these acts, though, would turn away from that quiet trust in the will of the Father into that desire to simply please people. So how does Jesus respond? Verse seven, Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. This third temptation is just a bold offer of power, but it's often disguised in just unassuming ways. Jesus is a king, right? 
but what kind of king will he be and what will his kingdom be like? He would rule over nations, yes, but how? And the accuser says, fall down and worship me. Do it my way and I'll give it to you. The unassuming way of, well, the ends justify the means. Might means right. Use power, Jesus. Use violence and you can rule. I'll give it to you. The accuser offered Jesus the kingdom without the cross. Jesus knew that God's Messiah must be a suffering servant, a suffering Messiah. And how does Jesus respond to this temptation from the devil? Verse 10. Then Jesus said, be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Be gone, Satan. Be gone. Jesus responds to this temptation of Satan the same way he responds to his disciple Peter in Matthew 16. This is when Peter pulls him aside after Jesus says the Messiah must endure the cross and suffer. And what does Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Be gone. Verse 11, the last verse. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Jesus passes the test in the wilderness. Where all of humanity, me and you have failed, Jesus succeeds. Where the covenant people of God, Israel failed, Jesus succeeds and has victory. And it says the devil left him. So let's think through what this means for you and me. First, as you imagine the story you were reading today, if you're like me, often I almost have like a cartoonish battle between Jesus and the devil. As if Jesus is in the devil and this red pitchforked gargoyle creature comes and says, hey Jesus, the devil here, let's see if we can get you to make some lunch, do some tricks off the temple, or how about you just bow down to me and worship me? I don't believe it's like that at all. As Jesus shares his wilderness testing with his disciples to form them and to prepare them and shape them, I suspect that Satan came to Jesus the same way he comes to you and me. Often disguised as our own thoughts, a subtle voice, a question. My friends, do you recognize the voice of the accuser? What's the conversation been like in your thoughts through this wilderness moment we find ourselves in? Do you recognize those? It often sounds like, man, if you're really loved by God, you're a son and daughter of Jesus, why does your life look like this? Like, why this disappointment? Look at the decisions you've made or are making. Friends, these voices do not define who you are. Who you are first and foremost is defined by Jesus, who loves you, who gave his life for you. That is who you are. That's your value. Romans 12, 2 says this, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may, that by testing you may discern what the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Don't miss that the spirit led Jesus into the wilderness because the same place the accuser wants to use to destroy you is the same place the spirit wants to use to develop you. Second, notice the way that Jesus responded to the accuser. What did he do? In each case, Jesus quotes scripture in response to the temptations of Satan. And if you look at the footnotes in the bottom of your Bible, you can see the verses that Jesus used. He quotes from Deuteronomy. He uses scripture that he has meditated on, internalized, held fast to, and then he speaks speaks that to the tempting thoughts that enter. It's so important in what you fill your soul with because in those moments of testing, what you've put in is what comes out. And as we follow the way of Jesus, as we do what Jesus did, we see that Jesus has filled himself with God's words through scripture. And at that moment of testing, it's those words that keep him from failing the testing. A few weeks ago, I I can't tell you how important that was for me. I'm trying to read and meditate on a psalm every day, not perfectly, mind you. And it just so happens that this particular day, I'm in Psalms 94. And Psalms 94 
as I opened my Bible that day, starts with this line, O Lord, God of vengeance. And I'm like, oh man, this is going to be one of those like super intense Psalms. And so I'm reading and honestly, nothing's really resonating with me. I'm just reading that morning. And then I get to this one line and I'm not exaggerating. It's like the brakes of my heart just slammed to a halt. It's as if Jesus grabbed my face and said, read it again, read it again, read it again. And it was Psalms 94 and 19. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. Let me read that again. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. And I wrote that down on a piece of paper because that day, the cares of my heart were many. And it was that day that the enemy was speaking so suddenly. I would grab that verse and I would just say that, reminding my soul that, man, when the cares of my heart are many, Jesus, Jesus' consolations, they cheer my soul. So Bridge family, may you be reminded this week to abide in Jesus for we, as Hebrews 4.15 says, do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect was tempted as we are, yet without sin. May God give you wisdom in the wilderness to discern the voice of the accuser and the strength to stand firm in Christ. And may you this week be reminded of who you are in Jesus. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for the story. Jesus, thank you for, for giving us this story that we can be reminded to fill our souls with your words, that scripture will light our path, that when accusations come from the enemy, that we know what to do, Jesus, because you've taught us, that we will remind ourselves of your words, remind ourselves of your promises. I pray that this week and in this season, which can feel like a wilderness, God, that you um, remind ourselves that you can empathize with that, that you've walked there too. Would you remind us, Jesus, that you have the victory, that even when we fail or we misstep, that we can come to you, that we can come to you and know that grace covers that and follow in your ways again. So Jesus, I just bless those watching today. God, would your um, just peace guard their hearts and their minds in you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. Grace and peace to you, Bridge family.